Hey guys, welcome to the final feast. I'm Natasha Diamond. I'm really interested in true crime. I love to bake and I have a weird fascination with what convicts choose to use their last meal on death row. So that's what I do over here. I cook their last meal and I tell their story. All the links to any recipes I use will be in the description box below so that you can try them out yourself and let me know what you think in the comment section. This is my first ever video so I'm really excited to share with you what I've been working on. I hope to post a video out every single week so let's just jump into my first case. Let's turn up the heat on this devious seductress Teresa Lewis. What began as a lustrous affair quickly turned into a deadly murder for hire plot. But did Teresa seduce two naive young men into her vindictive murder for hire scheme? Or were these just two money hungry men that saw dollar signs in Teresa's eyes and would do anything for a payout? While we look into Teresa's dark past, I'll be making my own version of her very last meal on death row, which was fried chicken, peas with butter, German chocolate cake and Dr Pepper. Now, she did have two options for her dessert, apple pie or German chocolate cake, but as I'm half German, I thought this is a great opportunity for me to share one of my family's recipes that's been passed down for generations. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but it's called a Kugelhopf, and you can either have it as a fruit cake or a chocolate cake, so obviously I'll be making the chocolate cake for you guys today. On the 30th of October 2002, just before 4am, the local sheriff's office in Danville, Virginia received a frantic phone call from a 33-year-old woman named Teresa Lewis. She explained that an intruder had broken into her home and shot her husband, 51-year-old Julian Lewis, and her stepson, 25-year-old Charles Lewis. Around 20 minutes later, officers arrived at the scene to find Charles dead in his bedroom, while Julian lay wounded on the floor of the master bedroom, barely clinging to life. Both men had been shot multiple times while Teresa claimed to have barricaded herself inside the bathroom. However, officers quickly began to suspect Teresa's story as her husband murmured his last words, my wife knows who done this to me, before taking his last breath. Suspicions towards Teresa were heightened in the days following the double murder due to her avaricious behaviour. She appeared more concerned with financial gain than that of a grieving widow. But why and how would she do something of this calibre? Who helped her? And was the motive really just for money? To answer these questions, let's look a little deeper into the life of Teresa Lewis. Teresa was born on the 26th of April 1969 in Danville, Virginia. She grew up in poverty with both parents working in a textile mill. As a child, Teresa sang in the church choir, which is where she met her first husband, Mr Bean. In 1985, when Teresa was only 16, she dropped out of school and ran away to marry Bean. Teresa herself admitted that although she attended church every Friday and Sunday, her behaviour out of church was far from holy. She took drugs, stole, lied and participated in multiple affairs. In the midst of all this, Teresa fell pregnant with a little girl who they named Christy Lynn Bean. Eventually, the marriage fell apart and ended in divorce. Teresa's mother-in-law, Marie Bean, described her as not right. In and out of low-paying jobs, Teresa turned to alcohol and painkillers for comfort. However, in the year 2000, things started looking up for Teresa and Christy. She found a stable job at Dan River Mills, a textile factory in Danville. It was there that she met a man named Julian Clifton Lewis Jr. and a romantic relationship quickly ensued. Julian Lewis was born on the 1st of January 1951 in Danville, Virginia, where he'd lived and worked most of his life. He was a veteran in the US Army, serving in Vietnam before working as an electrician at the Dan River Mills. Julian was a religious man and a dedicated member of the Faith Church Ministries and the Praise Worship Team. He married his late wife, Joyce Dale Evans, in 1972 and they had three children together, Jason, Charles and Kathy, who were adults by this point. Unfortunately, Joyce passed away in January of 2000. This didn't prevent Julian from pursuing a whirlwind romance with Teresa, quickly moving her and her daughter Christy into his home in June 2000. That same year, they got married and Teresa quit her job at the mill. Things appeared to be going well for the newlyweds until December 2001. Julian's oldest son, Jason, died tragically in a car accident at only 27 years old. As Julian was the beneficiary of Jason's life insurance, he received a hefty payout of $200,000, which he used the following year to purchase a mobile home and five acres of land in Pennsylvania, Virginia. Himself, Teresa and Christy moved in in February 2002. Later that year, Julian's younger son Charles, 
who was a U.S. reservist in the military, took out a $250,000 life insurance policy in anticipation of his upcoming deployment to Iraq. He named his dad as primary beneficiary and his stepmom Teresa as secondary beneficiary. Unbeknown to him, this well-intended decision would be the reason for his fatal demise. While I was waiting in line at a Walmart store in Danville, and now 32-year-old Teresa met 21-year-old Matthew Schallenberger and his trailer mate, 18-year-old Rodney Fuller. She exchanged numbers with Matthew, and before long, she was back to her old adulterous ways. Within days of meeting the younger man, they began a sexual relationship. Throughout the affair, Teresa showered Matthew with gifts and told him that her marriage was falling apart. According to Matthew, Teresa claimed that her husband was dominant and abusive. Teresa's wild sexual rendezvous didn't stop with Matthew and eventually Rodney began having sex with her too. One evening, Teresa even took Christy to meet up with the two men in a car park. She encouraged her then 16-year-old daughter to sleep with Rodney in one car while she slept with Matthew in another. With Charles's life insurance money always in the forefront of her mind, Teresa began devising a way to get rid of both Charles and Julian in order to obtain that $250,000 payout. Using sex, money and charm, Teresa informed Matthew and Rodney of her plans. They agreed to help her murder the two men in exchange for a share of the insurance money. Christy was aware of this plan, but didn't participate in the murder itself. The three came up with a plan in which Rodney and Matthew were to stop Julian's car on his drive home and shoot him, making it look like a car robbery gone wrong. They would then kill Charles when he came home for his father's funeral. Teresa informed the two men of Julian's route home from work and withdrew $1,200 for them to purchase the guns and ammunition necessary to carry out the plan. However, on the night, the two men were unable to see it through as the car was following close to Julian's car the whole way, meaning they'd have a witness. They needed another plan and one quickly fell into Teresa's lap. She learned that Charles would be visiting while he was away from army training in Maryland from the 23rd to 30th of October. This would give them ample opportunity to attack both men in their own home. Matthew and Rodney would of course be doing the dirty work while Teresa sat back and waited. On the 29th of October 2002, Teresa prayed with Julian before bed, then lay next to him as he fell asleep for the last time. Hearing his snores, she crept out of bed, unlocked the trailer door and then shut their family dog, a pit bull, in another room so that it wouldn't interfere with the intruders. In the early hours of the morning, Teresa was awoken by Matthew standing over her bed. He gestured for her to leave and she snuck into the kitchen. She heard gunshots as Matthew shot Julian multiple times. Rodney followed suit, shooting Charles at close range as he lay sleeping in bed. Unlike Matthew, Rodney made sure that Charles was dead before leaving. Sickeningly, as Julian lay on his bedroom floor, badly injured and barely clinging to life, Teresa stole his wallet and shared out the $300 he had with her accomplices. The two men then collected a few gunshot shells from the bedroom and left. Teresa waited a whole 45 minutes before calling for help which the coroner said could have saved Julian's life. When the police arrived, Julian was clinging on to life. It was at this point that he muttered the words, baby, 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 baby. When an officer asked him his name, he was able to respond. And when asked if he knew who had done this to him, he replied, my wife knows who done this to me. Coincidentally, the deputy sheriff overheard Teresa on the phone to someone complaining to them that she told Charles not to leave the back door unlocked. With police already suspicious following Julian's last chilling words, Teresa now had to disclose her account of the tragedy that had taken place. There had been an increase in burglaries in the same area recently, so initially police thought this could have been a burglary gone wrong. However, this idea was quickly thrown out when Teresa recalled her account of what happened. She claimed that after praying before bed with her husband, she went to the kitchen to make him a packed lunch for work the next day then joined him in bed. In the early hours of the morning, she had woken to find a man standing over her bed. Unfortunately, in the dark, it was unable to get a clear look at his face, but was able to get past him and barricade herself in the bathroom. It was there where she heard multiple gunshots, but remained in the bathroom for a further 45 minutes. Teresa finally called 911 once she was sure that the coast was clear. 
Following this account, police became even more suspicious of Teresa. For one, they found her oddly calm during the retelling of such a harrowing and traumatic experience, which ended in the murder of her own husband and stepson. She didn't even seem sad when they informed her that they'd both passed away. Investigators also questioned why she would leave her loved ones bleeding out, knowing that they had been shot for a whole 45 minutes before calling for assistance or even checking on them. Of course she would be terrified for her own safety, but 45 minutes is an extremely long time all the same. Back at the trailer, investigators found the lunch bag that Teresa had mentioned making that night, with some eerily strange notes attached to it. They read, I love you, I hope you have a good day and a drawing of a smiley face next to the words, I miss you when you're gone. Forensics collected evidence including numerous gunshot shells and a shoe impression outside the back door, which didn't match any of the shoes in the house. The autopsy results showed that Julian had been shot in his upper left arm, abdomen, pelvis, shoulder, penis, thighs, legs, arms and chest. However, none of these shots were fatal and ultimately he died from blood loss. Charles, on the other hand, died instantly from his gunshot wounds to his chest, abdomen, back, face and neck. It was in the hours and days following the deaths that Teresa raised the most suspicion and showed how money hungry she really was. That same morning, on the day her supposed loved ones were killed, Teresa called Julian's supervisor to inform him of his gruesome death before requesting to pick up his paycheck later that day. Due to legality, she was unable to do this. Soon after, she called Charles's commanding officer, Michael Booker, in regards to his military life insurance. She informed him that she was Charles's secondary beneficiary and she was told that she'd be contacted within 24 hours about when she'd received the money. In court, Michael testified that Teresa had disclosed to him that she was already making plans to sell Julian's mobile home and land. She would also be trading in her red sports car, previously purchased by her husband, along with his car, in order to trade for a bigger one. On the 4th of November, Teresa called Michael Booker again, this time requesting for Charles's personal belongings to be sent to her. She got angry when she was informed that they'd be going to Charles's only living next of kin, his sister Kathy. At this point, she reminded Michael that she was his secondary beneficiary and he ensured her that she would still be entitled to the money. Teresa relayed this information to Kathy on the day of the wake, making certain that she was aware that Teresa would be the sole beneficiary of everything. Money was now no object. Of course, many people found Teresa's approach to her inheritance strange. She seemed more concerned with obtaining what she was owed than grieving for the family she'd just lost. They passed on these concerns to investigators who were already closely monitoring Teresa's actions when it came to financial benefit. Officers closed in on Teresa after she attempted to withdraw $50,000 from Julian's bank account. She presented a cheque made payable to her, but the bank teller refused to cash this as the signature was obviously forged and looked nothing like the one Julian had on record. After being rejected, Teresa caused the scene in the bank before leaving. She was reprimanded by police officers on the 7th of November. It was at this point where Teresa's story changed and she partially confessed to her involvement in the double murder. For unknown reasons, she initially only implicated Matthew in her confession. Teresa informed police that she'd hired Matthew Schellenberger to do her dirty work, which he did successfully and expected half of Charles's life insurance inheritance proceeds. However, Teresa changed her mind and decided not to give him any of the money. Teresa was escorted to Matthew's trailer, where she identified him. Initially, when questioned, he too denied any part in the murder, but admitted that he owned a shotgun and allowed the police to search his bedroom. This search provided damning evidence that Matthew would have a hard time denying. Under his bed, they found a shotgun and inside his closet they found two pairs of yellow rubber gloves and another shotgun. When tested, one of the guns matched the shotgun shells found in Julian's bedroom, meaning that this was the gun used to kill Julian. The rubber gloves were covered in primer residue caused by shooting this firearm. With Matthew still not talking, police turned their attention back on Teresa, who eventually revealed the full story. She explained that Rodney Fuller was the second shooter and her daughter Christy had known about the plan. Rodney was taken into custody where he confessed to his involvement in the crime but insisted Teresa was the mastermind behind it all. Following Rodney's confession, all three were charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Teresa was assessed by a psychologist to ensure that she was competent to stand trial. Her IQ test resulted in a low score of 72 
However, the cutoff suggesting some form of learning disability is 70. This meant that she was deemed fit to stand trial and understood her plea and its potential consequences. Although she had limited intellect, no medical professional concluded that she had any learning difficulties, although many describe her as borderline mentally disabled. She was tried in Virginia, where under their law, if a person has committed multiple murders within a three-year period, they can be sentenced to the death penalty. In attempts to avoid this, Teresa invoked her statutory right to bypass a jury and instead get sentenced directly from the trial judge. Her defence hoped that she'd be granted leniency as she pleaded guilty and had been fully cooperative with the police throughout the investigation. However, the judge deemed Teresa as the manipulative mastermind behind the crime, labelling her the head of the serpent. She was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Matthew Schellenberger and Rodney Fuller were tried in separate trials, both receiving life imprisonment. In 2006, Matthew took his own life behind bars. Christy Bean got five years in prison for her part. As Teresa sat on death row at Flavana Correctional Centre in Virginia, many members of the public and even some celebrities were in uproar. They couldn't understand why Teresa was being put to death while her two male accomplices were able to spend their life in prison. She was the only woman on death row in Virginia at the time of her conviction and will be the first woman to be put to death in nearly a century. It was in 1912 that Virginia Christian, a 17-year-old woman, had been put to death by electric chair. Supporters filed 7,300 appeals for clemency. Teresa was remorseful, a model prisoner and borderline intellectually disabled. Teresa herself wrote a letter to the judge expressing her remorse and how unfair she felt it to be that her counterparts who actually pulled the trigger received a more lenient sentence. However, all appeals were denied and on the 23rd of September 2010 at 9pm, a 41-year-old Teresa Lewis was put to death by lethal injection at the Greensville Correctional Centre, Virginia. In her final words, she expressed to Cathy how sorry she was and told her that she loved her. For her last meal, she had fried chicken, peas with butter, German chocolate cake and dots of pepper. If you've made it this far, then thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed my first ever episode. Let me know what you think in the comments and make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss out on next week's episode. Thank you and enjoy every meal as if it was your last. Bye.